That's a holy hush, isn't it? Such a beautiful, beautiful anthem. Thank you, guys. Um, we're about to read from 2 Samuel 6, 1 to 5, and 12b to 19. You can find that in your pew Bible in uh, page 244. This passage relates the story of King David returning the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And then a celebration follows with David leading the people in dance and song. So let's see what happens as all engage in David's blessing, sharing bread, meat, and raisins. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David and all the people with him set out and went from Baal Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. They carried the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the Ark of God, and Ahio went in front of the Ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Jill, I think um, it's been said by those in the know that that was the hardest uh, scripture to read of uh, the whole past year with all those names in there. And uh, wow, you did a great job. May God grant us wisdom and understanding. Steven Spielberg directed a movie that was set in 1936. Was anybody around then in 1936? And featured an archaeologist and an adventurer named Indiana Jones. And Jones was hired by the U.S. government to find the Ark of the Covenant before Adolf Hitler's Nazis could obtain its uh, rumored awesome power. Do you remember the movie? Well... There's a poster. Now do you remember the movie? Yeah. Here's a familiar scene. 3,000 years, man has searched for the lost Ark of the Covenant. The Bible speaks of the Ark leveling mountains and laying waste to entire regions. Not something to be taken lightly. No one knows its secrets. Jones, do you realize what the Ark is? It's a transmitter. It's a radio for speaking to God. An army which carries the Ark before it is invincible. The Ark, it is their Atanis. And it is something that man was not meant to disturb. All right, so this morning's text focuses on the Ark of the Covenant. And David brings the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. So what, right? Big deal. I mean, what does this ancient Bible story, no offense, Jill, I think you did a great job reading it, have to do with us today? Would it surprise you that Charles Dickens' character, Ebenezer Scrooge, is linked to this story of the ark, which was lost to the Philistines at a place called none other than Eber-Ezer? Tricky! Ebenezer. Yeah, the ark symbolizing the presence of God was lost and found just like old Scrooge was transformed from hug, humbug to Mr. Giddy, giving out all kinds of presents. Do you remember Washington Irving's character, Ichabod Crane? Anybody? Yeah, Legend of Sleepy Hollow, right? This short story. If you didn't read it, perhaps you saw the movie with Johnny Depp or all the different iterations in, uh, that Disney has, has done of uh, film ap- adaptations. Well, if you're familiar with First and Second Samuel, then you'll remember that this strange name, Ichabod, appears after Israel loses the ark in war with the Philistines. Shiloh's old priest, Eli, drops dead when he finds out about it. And, he, and when uh, his daughter-in-law gives birth to a son, they name him... Ichabod. I was glad to hear this weekend that my son Ben uh, does not intend to name his first child Ichabod, uh, but Styles, uh, you know, if it's a boy, Styles after uh, Grandpa uh, Styles Mattingly. Beautiful. Ichabod, what's up with that? Well, 
She named the child Ichabod, meaning the glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God had been captured. Again, the ark is associated with the presence of God. Now, some characters get that presence back, they lose it, and then they get it back. And others, maybe they never had it, maybe they had it, but then they lose it. And we're left wondering, well, what happened to them? Crane was motivated Uh, Ichabod Crane was motivated by his anxiety and fear of the unknown, and he was so highly suspicious and harassed by his rival, Brom, Brom Bones, what a name for a rival, Brom Bones. Uh, They're both after the same girl, but I digress. Anyway, it's not clear what happened to this guy, but whatever it was, he was never heard uh, from again in Sleepy Hollow. So the presence of God comes and it goes in people's lives. Today's text is aligned more with Ebenezer Scrooge, that story, then Ichabod Crane. All is well in Israel, you might say. They have a new warrior king, King David. He's, you know, he's conquered Jerusalem, and now he's established it as this uh, strategic capital city. And he humbly decided to rename it the city of David. Yeah, yeah. Uh, David builds a splendid cedar palace. His family grows as he adds wives. Ben, I would stick with just one. It's, it's better that way. Uh, and, and, and then they have more children, and we enter the story. We enter this story that Jill read for us just after they had won two overwhelming victories against the Philistines. All that remains is to get that ark back, the Ark of the Covenant. Get it back into the capital city so that it can now you know, become the, the political and the religious center of Israel. And so the ark is this like symbolic centerpiece for Israel's religion. It's the most visible symbol of the presence of God. The place where the Lord Almighty, we're told, is enthroned between the cherubim. That's what, when you saw the shadow of that carried with those long rods, you couldn't touch the ark. You had the long rods to go through the rings. And there were two uh, wings on the top. Those were the cherubim, cherubim, uh, right? The angels. Uh, and supposedly that's where, right in there, is where uh, Moses or whoever could r- lean in and hear from God. Here's Steven Spielberg's artistic impression of the Ark of the Covenant. This is from the film uh, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, and this is actually uh, now at the National Geographic Museum in Washington, D.C. Those are the wings up there of the, the, the cherubim. And although King David has recently become you know, the symbol himself of God's presence. That's kind of what they did back then. Oh, you're the king. You must be like a son of God. You must be divine in a sense. He's familiar with this ancient tradition. He's a smart leader and he knows, but what I really need to finish this all off is to get that ark back. And so he decides he needs to bring it back into the city. And one scholar puts it this way. He says, when David brings the ark to Jerusalem, he literally will be bringing God into the center of his kingship. So this guy's motivated. And we've seen absurd modern-day examples of politicians trying to use God for their, for their benefit, right? But I digress. Anyway, uh, how will David bring back the ark? Well, the Philistines had captured it, right, um, in a previous uh, battle. And they were celebrating their victory over Israel. And they said, let's take that. That seems to be important to them. Besides, it was gilded with gold, so it was valuable. Um, and so they thought, well, you know, Israel, not so powerful, and their God, not so powerful, but uh, let's take it. So they take it, and they think that was the right move, but then terrible things start to happen to them. Uh, their main God, in small g, topples from his throne, and a terrible disease breaks out among them, and they associate all the bad stuff with that golden ark. And they're, we got to get rid of this thing right? And so they send it packing on a cart. They don't use the special, you know, rods that go through the rings. They don't care about all that stuff the way God had told back in Exodus how an ark's supposed to be carried. You know, it's so holy and reverent. You gotta, can't touch it. You gotta use these rods. They didn't do that. They just lift it up, put it on a cart, and ship it over to Abinadab for uh, quite some time. David interprets his recent victories Uh, over the Philistines as, okay, now it's time, the perfect opportunity. Let's go back and get the ark. And so he goes to Abinadab and uh, he uh, imitates the Philistines. Now he doesn't do what God had 
spelled out to do and how to revere this ark, he just puts it up on a cart and he starts uh, bringing it home. David puts the, the ark on the cart and, and uh, it's a bit hilly. If you've ever been to Israel, how many people have been to Israel? Yeah, I, a sermon coming up. I got a bunch of pictures of the Sea of Galilee and we're going to go to Gennesaret and you know the Jesus boat. They call it the Jesus boat. It's one of 600 boats that existed. I digress. In Jesus' day, uh, it's amazing. And they found it in the, in the, in the mud uh, when the lake was real low. It's pretty cool. But if you have been to Jerusalem, you know it's hilly. And so you can imagine going up and down with a cart with a heavy laden golden ark. Probably going to have some trouble on this cart. We didn't have the shocks back then that we have today, right? And so a huge celebration breaks out surrounding this slowly moving ark. David and the whole house, we're told, of Israel celebrate with all their might before the Lord with song and harps and lyres and tambourines and sistrums, those are drums, and cymbals. You can imagine, you can picture it. It might, um, you know, this festive spirit might not be unlike what we experienced recently. This is one of our music and mingles, and that's our very own Abby, who now sings in the choir right here as the lead singer of So Rad. Okay, anyway, you, you kind of get the feeling, right? A little different instruments, but it's that celebrative spirit. And David's dancing. He starts taking off his clothes. He's down to his loincloth, and his wife is like, oh my gosh, this is not kingly at all, right? <laughs> And she got really upset with him, but he's just processing to Jerusalem, great rejoicing. The Beach Reporter published an article this week on the dance craze that swept the nation back in the 30s. And again, uh, anybody remember this? No, no. The Jitterbug, the Lindy Hop, the Charleston, earlier dance called the Texas Tommy, which ironically was uh, created in San Francisco, California, but... I don't know why they call it the Texas Tommy. Anyway, of course, there were uh, attempts by uh, outraged civic guardians of decency to control and suppress all this frenetic dancing, all this happiness, all this celebration. And I'm sure our neighbors sometimes wonder, is that a church? Do they have a keg out there drinking beer on Father's Day with a car show? <laughs> is that a rock band? Yeah, uh, we don't have a problem celebrating here at, at Torrey Pines. Uh, but his wife, oh, that was beneath the dignity of his kingly stature. And back in the day, there was a whole group of people that were opposed to all this dancing that was taking place. That doesn't stop King David. He dances the ark all the way home to Jerusalem with sacrifices and unrestrained celebration. Our story ends with the ark being placed in a specially designated tent called a tabernacle, and there David offers sacrifices before the Lord. And with the presence of God fully ensconced in the city of David, David blesses the people. Um, Almighty God is honored. He gives them food for a ritual of a feast of celebration. Uh, I don't know if it was barbecue or not, but they were all happy and blessed. God is home. David is king. Jerusalem has become the city of God. All is well right? Right? Well, that depends on who's asking. We already know that his first wife is upset, but the lectionary conveniently skips Uzzah's story altogether. Maybe it's done out of fear, fear of the prickly parts in the Bible. The prickly parts of the whole story might ruin the fun. So in good conscience, I can't stand up here and skip over the dark parts of the story, even though, Jill, they're not in the lectionary. I didn't ask you to read them. Besides, so often, I think it's in the texts of terror, as Phyllis Tribble used to call them, the texts of terror, those things that make us go, ooh, that doesn't sound like the God I worship, right? That provide a conversation, that get us stimulated and engaged in thinking about, well, the nature of God and it can energize an intellectual engagement. And that's what I hope happens this morning. So let's go back and look at the unpleasant parts of this otherwise pleasant story. 
Uzzah and his brother Ahiho, uh, or you probably not pronounced it more accurately than I did, they're helping to move the ark, these two guys, the brothers. They're familiar with it. After all, been in their home for months, right? And uh, so they have some oxen that are pulling the cart, but unfortunately something happens, it stumbles, somebody stumbles, there's a rut, whatever, starts to slide. Uzzah reaches out to stop the ark. It's a good thing, you know? He's trying to help. God, we're told, God strikes him dead for trying to help. It's right there in the Bible, not in the lectionary, but it's in the Bible. Uzzah instinctively reaches out his hand to steady it, and that's what we're told. God immediately strikes Uzzah dead for touching the ark. The well-intentioned helper dies right there and then. David is stunned, and he's angry with God. Can we blame him? He's so angry that he curses the place, and he gives it a name to commemorate the outrageous thing that he believes God has done. And what's more, he gets really afraid about this ark. Like, if that happened, that, you know, do I really want this ark in my home? So he stops the procession because he doesn't want such a dangerous object anywhere near him. Would you want it in your home after what it had done to the Philistines, after what it had done to Uzzah? And he says these words, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? See, all this prickly stuff got left out of the lectionary. Aren't you glad I'm including it for you this morning? And that's how the ark comes to reside in the home of Oda, Obed-Edom. And it stays there for three months. And it might have stayed there forever. But then David caught wind of what was happening at Odom edom All kinds of blessings. All kinds of blessings. And David's like, blessings? Blessings? He's got blessings? Maybe I need to go back and get that ark. We'll just be careful this time in how we bring it back. And so he does. David releases his anger, releases his fear, brings the ark to Jerusalem where he and his people are blessed, we're told, by God, we're told, for many years. Now, what can an intellectually honest preacher do with a text like this? Especially when we include the dark parts, right? Uzzah's death doesn't set well with me. How about you? I prefer a God like the one we read in Exodus 34. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. I like that God. It's in the Old Testament too. Some of you are like, when are you going to preach from the Old Testament? Well, I'm preaching from the Hebrew Bible. How do you like it? Some of you have told me you don't believe in the biblical God. Uh, We have actually several people in our church that are so active and give generously and attend even the Bible studies and say, well, I'm an atheist. And and I'm like, all are welcome here. Glad to have you. Glad to have you. So some of you who don't believe in a biblical God, you have no trouble with this story. De facto, it didn't happen because there's no God, right? Um. There's no deity, nothing to get upset about. Maybe Uzzah freaked out that he was going to be responsible for the ark breaking, and so he had a heart attack right then and there and dropped it. You know, whatever the scientific rationale is, that's where you go. And hey, all power to you. Okay, but the majority of you listening online and here uh, believe in God. And so for you, this raises a really difficult question. Which God do you believe in? right? The one full of grace and mercy and love, or the one who by no means clears the guilty and visits the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation, as we read in Exodus 34, 7. Which one is it? Does God's holiness prohibit mere humans from treating God as one of us? Is that the message we're supposed to take home? Don't take God's holiness for granted. Is this the message? We worship an absolute, untouchable, dangerous God. Beware. Is that the message? You know, if children or grandchildren ever ask me, Pastor Mike or Grandpa, they're going to call me Mika. That's my name, my grandpa name. 
course, if Huddy rebels and calls me something else, I'll, I'll, I'll answer to what he says. But Did God really kill Uzzah for touching the ark? If they ask me that question, are we to justify Uzzah's death and explain to them, well, honey, God had very specific instructions about how to handle the ark. And it involved rings built into the ark through which long poles were inserted. And specially chosen priests were to hoist the ark and those poles so that no one would touch the holy symbol of the Holy One. When Uzzah touched the ark, he violated. That means he went against, honey. He went against the firm rules for how God's people were to deal with the Holy One. And so, yes, dear, Uzzah had it coming. <laughs> What's the lesson here? Well, we're, we need to respect the holiness of God because we, uh, you know, and then we can rejoice and dance and go down to our loincloths and get, have a blast and worship the God of grace and mercy. And we can dance before the presence of God, but we shouldn't get too carried away. And never, ever, ever, honey, never, ever touch what you're not supposed to touch. That's a message I will never say to anyone. And some of you have asked me, point blank, well, why don't you preach more from the Old Testament? And, 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 and I'll say, well, I, I do plan on preaching more from the Hebrew Bible, but not because of all the depictions of the biblical God, but because of the sticky parts, the texts of terror. Uh, they give me an opportunity to say what I'm saying today. And share that I don't believe uh, quite a bit that is stated in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. And when I consider the blessing of being in the presence of God, I much prefer the New Testament text, such as this. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Here's another favorite. He saved us, not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And then one last one from Titus 5, 3, 5. Here's one more. For by grace, oh, love that word. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's a gift of God. Well, Washington Irving and Charles Dickens wrote classics, and those classics have passed the test of time. For Ebenezer Scrooge, God's presence, God's love, hey man, it transformed his life. The miserly chains were broken by love. Beautiful story. That's why we still watch it. Sadly, Ichabod Crane, uh, he never found what he was looking for. He didn't get the girl. He didn't get real love. And uh, believe what you will, and here you can believe what you will of the dangers of God's holy presence. I believe the far greater danger in this life is attempting to live it out of some overwhelming fear of an angry God. It's far better, I think, to dance in the presence of love and mercy and grace. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.